The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you for joining us for uh, Hobo Water Logger Deployment Considerations. Ask the experts. I am Eileen Sander, Senior Application Specialist, and joining me today uh, is Paul Gannett, Product Marketing Manager. Uh, I've been here about 19 years. Paul has been here over 20, but has uh, many more years of experience in the environmental market. And uh, we're happy to work with everyone uh, and happy that you could join us today. This webinar is being recorded, and we will make it available to attendees afterwards. Uh, we will uh, answer questions as we go along. Some people have submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, we'll address those uh, common questions again. You can enter questions at any time, and uh, we will have time for additional questions and answers at the end. Uh, again, feel free to type in any questions uh, during the webinar, and uh, we'll make an effort to address most of those uh, as we go along. Uh, a little uh, brief overview of Onset. Most of you are probably familiar with us. Uh, the company's been in business since 1981. Uh, primarily, uh, we are involved in the environmental monitor, uh, pardon me, me, monitoring uh, solutions for the water market, and we do have a global network of distributors. And right now, I am going to hand over our agenda to uh, Paul Gannett and briefly cover, um, we're going to be covering our water level loggers, our uh, tidbit uh, water temperature loggers, conductivity, salinity. And Paul, um, here you go. All right. Thanks, Eileen. Once again, greetings to everyone. Um, I want to thank all of you who sent questions in advance. Uh, what I've done is I've gone through those and prepared answers to some of the common questions that you sent in so that I can actually show you some pictures and diagrams to help clarify those questions. And I've organized them into these areas so that, they, you know, just kind of um, it'll, it'll make it flow a little bit smoother rather than jumping around. So uh, you can see some of the areas that I'm going to be going into. I'm going to talk about following. I'm going to be talking about mounting methods. Uh, I'll be addressing questions on uh, the, the direct read water level logger, and uh, we'll talk about calibration. So we'll be hitting on each of these areas uh, with, with some prepared slides. And then, as Eileen mentioned, there will be time to uh, address other questions at the end. But also feel free to, if you have a question as we go, you can enter it. And if it uh, seems to fit in at the time, I'll, I'll try to address it then. So, as promised, first I'm going to talk about dealing with following. This, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, is a real issue uh, in water uh, logger deployment. So uh, here's some thoughts for, for helping to deal with that. Here's some nice, healthy uh, bio following. Probably uh, many of you have probably seen following similar to this. Uh, first I'm going to talk about following on temperature loggers. Uh, the good thing with temperature loggers is the, the following doesn't really affect the accuracy of the temperature measurement. Uh, it really just affects the, uh, you know, the response time. You know, if you get enough following on the logger, it's going to slow down the response time of the logger. The main issue with following for temperature loggers is following on the communications window or, uh, you know, following this on the logger that makes it so thick that you can't fit it inside the coupler. Uh, for uh, putting it into the base station or the uh, the shuttles. So it, you don't want the following to build up to the point where it's going to interfere with either the communications or the coupler set. So here's some different ways you can address that. Uh, some of our loggers, like our Hobo U22 Watertime Pro loggers, include a, a protective cap that you put over the communications window. And that's a nice way of keeping that clean and free of following. And that also 
uh, prevent fouling from building up on the area where it slides into the couplings. So that's a, you know, use that accessory. That's uh, easy enough to do. Then we also sell protect, uh, protected boots for several of our loggers. Like our, I showed a protected boot for the uh, tidbit logger here. Uh, that fits over the tidbit logger, and that uh, um, prevents light from getting to the logger, which helps reduce the amount of bio fouling. And it just, you know, and sediment fouling can't get to it because it kind of seals over the face of the logger. We also sell a boot for our Hobo Pro U22 loggers that covers, uh, covers that logger. Another thing that a lot of our users do is just they take tape, uh, such as electrical tape, put that over the communications window and the surfaces that have to fit into uh, the couplet. So uh, that's a quick and dirty way of protecting the, uh, uh, the loggers. And you just, when you go off to uh, out, offload the data, just peel off the tape, you know, plug them into the uh, base station or shuttle, offload the data, and then put you know, dry them off a little bit and put fresh tape on for the next deployment. And another thing that, that users do, if they're out there in the field, um, you know, clean off any following that's built up. You want to stay ahead of it uh, so it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, once it gets a layer on it, that, that following can lead to more following and a faster rate of following. So you want to stay ahead of it. You clean it off with a rag or gloves on your hands or a toothbrush if needed. Uh, a mild vinegar solution is another thing that can help uh, remove some of the following. So, several techniques. Another uh, way of reducing following and also providing some protection for the logger is to put it in some sort of protective housing. Uh, this is uh, from an EPA guide uh, where they use uh, PVC housing that they make. And they either glue them to rocks or they mount them to metal stakes and uh, they can put loggers, uh, such as our tidbit logger, inside them, and that, that'll reduce following and provide some protection for the logger. But and also make them, another consideration for something like this is make it easy to access the logger. So to access the logger in this case, they just screw it up and um, can uh, access the logger for data offload. So for our conductivity and dissolved oxygen loggers, those sensors are sensitive to following on the sensor, so you, you really um, uh, need to take additional measures to protect them from following. And one of the things you want to ask yourself is what type of following are you concerned with at your site? Is it bio-following, plant or animal growth on the, the sensor surface, or is it sediment following? And, and sometimes you'll have both. And the, the method you use for uh, addressing following can differ slightly depending on which type of following is most prevalent. If the main issue is biofouling, then you want to look at some of these techniques. If you're using the uh, U26 dissolved oxygen logger, we sell an optional, optional anti-following cap which has copper winding. That's a co uh, common way of, of uh, uh, reducing following uh, buildup. So the water has to go through those copper windings that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, reduces uh, the amount of following. Another choice is to put the logger inside a PVC pipe, and that cuts down on the light reaching uh, the, the uh, logger, and that can reduce the amount of following as well. We a lot of biofouling is tied to uh, photosynthesis and having light. But one thing is we have found in our testing that you don't want to use both the anti-following cap and the PVC pipe, because that just cuts off the flow of the water to the sensor too much, and you end up creating a little bit of a microclimate around the sensor, which can lead to uh, kind of extreme reading. It, 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 you'll see it in the data is, is you know, abnormally large variation between high and low DO reading. For our conductivity loggers, uh, we do sell a, uh, uh, basically it's a PVC housing, we call it our U2X protective housing, and that reduces the following by reducing the amount of light getting to the logger, and it has a screw off cap for easy access to the logger. And uh, for added protection in this case, you can take a, uh, like a copper screen and wrap it around the um, uh, PVC housing to, uh, you know, you get the benefits of the copper then. 
And then in that case, it doesn't cut off the flow so much that it's a problem. Um, in both cases, you're going to want to stay ahead of the following. You're going to have to keep track of how much following is building up on your sensors. And if you need to be out there every two weeks to clean off the following, to keep it from building up, you'll want to do that. Um, and that may be pretty common in the summertime. You need to be out there every couple of weeks to stay ahead of that. In the cooler seasons, getting out there every month or even longer may be enough to stay ahead of the following. And you'll see it, you know, building up. And another way of dealing with following is to use field calibrations at the beginning and end of each deployment segment and use those to correct for drift that's due to the following that happens. On the other hand, if your main issue is uh, sediment following, and this is common like downstream uh, like wastewater treatment plants or just very silty uh, streams. Uh, in this case, uh, the real key is making sure you get good flow uh, to the sensor so that the sediment doesn't build up on the sensor. And for that reason, you actually do not want to use the uh, optional anti-following cap. And the reason for that is you can see those copper windings are pretty tight. And if there's a lot of silt in your water, the sediment is going to build up on those copper windings and cut off the flow of water to your sensor. So uh, I know this may seem a little counterintuitive, but you're better off uh, not using the anti-fouling cap in this case. Uh, another key for reducing the amount of fouling in this case is making sure that the logger is supported above the bottom of the stream bed. You're going to get the most sediment flowing along the bottom of the stream bed. So you want to be at least a foot off the bottom of the stream if you're in a, uh, a high fouling environment. And I guess I, I should mention that these slides don't really address the um, U-20 water level loggers, but a lot of what we're saying here applies to them as well. It's, they're not quite as affected by following as the DO and, and connectivity loggers, but you, you still want to stay ahead of the, the following with those as well, and you may want to use some of these same techniques for those loggers. In extreme cases of uh, silt following, uh, there are battery-powered wipers that are out there. They're not cheap, uh, but uh, some users do use those. It's basically a fancy uh, electric toothbrush for your data loggers that brushes the, uh, the, uh, the silt or the biofouling off the face of your sensor. And I talk about keeping up with the following. Even with these anti-following accessories, you probably still will need to do some cleaning of the sensor faces. So I show here the sensor face for the DO logger and the conductivity loggers. And you, know, you want to clean those off with something like a toothbrush. It's a pretty common way of doing them. I mean, they're durable sensors, so they don't mind uh, getting brushed with a toothbrush. So that's kind of what I had on following. Um, oh, we have a question here about will these slides be available after the webinar? And, you know, we're going to make them available as a um, as a recording of the webinar, and we, we may be able to make them available as a PDF as well. So we'll, uh, yeah, if you, if you want a PDF of the slides, uh, send us a, an email to let, let us know you'd like that. So now I wanted to talk about the um, DO sensor caps. We get questions about when will my DO sensor cap expire. And a couple things you want to keep in mind is, one is that the DO sensor caps have a shelf life, so you, uh, you don't want to leave them on the shelf too long. And we give them the uh, shelf life right in the canister that those uh, DO sensor caps are shipped in. And it will say install by a certain date. And if you, as long as you install them by that date, you'll get the full uh, seven-month uh, cap life of uh, that, that, that sensor cap. So make sure to install them by that date. If for some reason you install them a month or two past that, what will happen is your cap life will be reduced by that month or two that you, uh, you missed that install date uh, by. So and then uh, the cap will take reading for seven months, starting from the first time the logger takes a reading with that cap. That could be a reading taken for calibration, it could be a reading taken for status, or it could be when it starts logging. But in any case, it's going to start on that time. And, and pulling the logger out and stopping it 
doesn't change that. It's still uh, seven months uh, cap life once it's taken that first reading. That's because that's, it's, it's built into basically it's a, it's looking at a clock, you know, calendar. Once it hits that seven months, uh, what it starts doing is it uh, starts showing readings of minus 888. And it's just a way of ensuring that uh, you get good quality data. If you over that six or seven month cap life, the calibration of the logger is going to be very good and stable, especially if you keep up with the, you know, your, your cleaning of the following, and it ensures that you get the best measurement performance. Oh, here's a uh, question. Actually, I should have noticed this before. Uh, it's how to clean the copper winding. Uh, so that's the key. Uh, this goes back to my previous discussion on following. So if you're using that uh, optional anti-following cap, yeah, you'd want to use that same toothbrush that I was talking about. Uh, you know, brush those windings, make sure that there's good flow of water between those windings. And you might want to brush inside and outside of those copper windings uh, to keep the flow of water going through those. And it also helps to make sure you're getting a good, you know, clean copper surface so it's going to be most effective uh, dealing with your biofoul. So, coming back to the agenda just to see where we're at. Uh, now I'm going to switch to talking about mounting of our logger. So lots of questions came in about mounting. So first I'm going to talk about mounting of water level loggers. What is the best way to deploy a Hobo U20 water level logger in a small stream? And I show some pictures here of typical uh, ways for uh, for mounting those. And you know. On the left is a classic uh, spilling well next to a staff gauge, and that's great for streams and next to docks and bridges uh, to put the uh, water level logger into that. You can just uh, suspend it from the top of the well, and you can lower it down into the into the water and, and pull it up uh, as needed for data offload. So that's a great way uh, to mount uh, water level loggers. And one thing I should mention on that is the stilling well doesn't have to be vertical. It's easier to take a reference water level measurement if that stilling well is vertical. But uh, you can have the, uh, the stilling well be at an angle. And that's useful for cases like if you're on a, uh, like monitoring water levels in a stream or a catch basin. And you don't want to have a, a, a well coming up in the middle of that stream because it might catch debris. Uh, floating by in the stream. So by having it run along the stream bank at an angle, uh, you can get the logger in and out of it to, to launch it and offload the data. Uh, and, it, and it still get good data because what it's, water level loggers are doing is just recording into the pressure of the water. So they really don't care if they're vertical, horizontal, or at an angle. It's just measuring the pressure. So that's a, a good option to keep in mind as well. The uh, pictures over on the right here show another common way of deploying water level loggers, which is to attach it to a rock or a concrete block and deploy it in the middle of a, uh, a stream. And you can see in the, it's a little hard to see in the, the, the mounting housing, it's a white PVC pipe that's mounted to the side of the fender block that's in the water. And that, um, uh, pipe is mounted horizontal, which just kind of goes to sh you know, show that the uh, logger can be mounted vertically or horizontally. And the nice thing about this kind of deployment is a lot of times it's a good way of hiding the loggers uh, because it's uh, out of sight. It can, uh, if somebody's just walking by, they, they may not notice it. And that's a, I think I may mention this in, a, in this slide. Yeah, uh, is it's a good way to avoid uh, vandals from tampering with the uh, uh, loggers, and that's a, a very common concern. A lot of these places are, are you know, public parks or uh, walk, you know, walking trails, and sometimes if people see a filling well or something like that, they might uh, get curious and uh, mess with your loggers, and putting it on the bottom of the stream is a good w way to avoid that. Now, the challenge is if you put it on the bottom of the stream is you've got to be able to find it. So you really you want to take... Uh, Pictures of the site. Uh, you want to, you know, enter the GPS locations. You know, one one idea I saw the other day was uh, if you have two people out deploying them, 
you can take a picture with one person pointing to where the logger is in the stream. So it just kind of gives you a, a real uh, orientation as to where to look for that logger and you know, put, put out some sort of hook or something to, to hook that logger and bring it up uh, to retrieve the data. And uh, the lower right there, you see a spilling well that's uh, mounted to a rock. And again, basically just the same thing as concrete block. Nice way of kind of blending in with the stream. Yeah. Um, now here's another uh, point I wanted to make sure to cover. If you're deploying the water level logger in a weir, a lot of times that will have a spilling well built into it. So uh, if you haven't bought it, uh, a weir yet. This is for uh, stream flow measurement application. If you haven't bought the weir yet or made the weir yet, you might want to look specifically for one that uh, you know has that filling well option. So I'll just make your job a little bit easier. Another question that we had in advance was, what is the best way to secure the hobo in the well? Is there a quick release so it can be used year after year? And this is uh, a picture of the uh, well cap that we sell. You know, you know uh, this has some nice advantages about it. There's other well caps out there as, as well. And on the left, you can kind of see the two parts to it. One is the well cap, and then that black assembly is just a, uh, it's a disc from which you can suspend your water level logger in a barometric pressure logger in the well. So it actually has a couple of attachment points uh, on that uh, little disc for suspending your loggers with uh, cables, like stainless steel cables like we sell, uh, in the well. And the nice thing about that cap is, uh, and that disc combination, is there's no way that that disc is going to slide into the well. It's, it's bigger than the diameter of the well cap. So it's um, uh, just a nice, safe way of deploying your loggers. When you want to offload the loggers, you just uh, pull up that black disc and with the loggers attached to it, uh, offload the data, and then you uh, feed the loggers back into the well and uh, lock up the cap. It's got a little eyelet there for putting a, a padlock to secure it. And um, so, you know, secure and very easy to use. So, like I said, there's other one well caps out there that provide similar functionality, but this is a nice, convenient one that we provide. Notice, I don't, it actually don't, doesn't show it, but the well cap should also have a vent hole. Actually, I think I mentioned that in the later slide. Oh, speaking of that, um, for water level, how should I mount the logger being used for barometric compensation? And Glad to see uh, questions about the uh, uh, barometric pressure logger. Because one of the things to keep in mind is that the accuracy of your water level measurements is dependent on both your water level logger as well as the accuracy of your barometric pressure logger. So it's important to mount that so that it provides you accurate uh, data. And keys and points to keep in mind for that barometric pressure logger are that you want to mount it where the temperature variations are going to be minimized. And the reason for that is a couple of things. One is the, well, first I should say that our loggers are temperature compensated to, you know, to account for temperature variation. But if the temperatures are changing, there's a little bit, there could be a little bit of a, um, a response time issue that, that can affect the accuracy of those measurements. And also, in extreme environments, if it's getting really cold, you might want to protect the loggers from those, those um, uh, cold temperatures because the uh, temperature calibration only goes down to basically the freezing range. So below that, uh, you can lose some accuracy. So. Uh, you want to minimize those extreme temperatures and those extreme temperature changes. So um, what do I want to say about that? Oh, I wanted to say this mounting that's shown here is a good way of minimizing those temperature variations because by putting the 
barometric pressure logger in the, uh, the top of the well where your other uh, water level logger is mounted, you're below ground level, and the ground is a great way of buffering uh, the logger from extreme uh, temperature variation. So it's a, a great place if you have room in your well above the water table for mounting a barometric pressure logger. That's a great place to uh, mount that logger. You just got to make sure there's a vent hole in the, um, the well cap or uh, in the top of the well so that it's uh, vented to atmospheric pressure. And you can use that one barometric pressure logger for other water level loggers in the area. As long as your barometric pressure logger is within 10 miles and 1,000 feet of elevation, uh, that should be it should be good enough uh, for your uh, barometric compensation. One thing that we get questions about a lot of times is, well, the barometric pressure is going to be different at different elevations. So if you go 1,000 feet up, yeah, your air is going to be at a slightly lower pressure. Well, by using our barometric compensation system and a reference water level measurement, it does the math to compensate out that uh, that difference in elevation. The, uh, so that, that's why it doesn't have to be right next to your water level logger. As long as you use a reference reading and the compensation assistant, the difference in elevation gets factored out. So here's another question we got, and it's tied uh, to it. Is the barometric logger is can you use it for your air temperature data? Um, you know, you might as well as you got it out there, it's recording temperature anyway. And the, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, the U20, U20L loggers, as well as our MX2001 loggers. Uh, well, no, I'll take that back. Uh, roll back that. Now, the 2001 loggers, I don't think, record air temperature. They, because they're designed to be in a well. So, um, so the U20 loggers record air temperature. And if an deployment tips, because now if you're using it for air temperature, you got to make sure that it's an accurate representation of the air temperature. So you got to have it in the shade. If you put it out in the sun, that sun's going to uh, heat up that logger and, and throw off your temperature reading. And you want to make sure that it's got good air circulation to the logger. So this, this is a case where you don't want to put it in the stilling well with the uh, uh, water level logger because that's going to be measuring ground temperature more than air temperature. So a couple ways you can get the uh, good air circulation and protect it from the sun is we sell a, uh, a solar radiation shield. There are actually a couple variations. One is the RS1 and the other is the N-RSA. And the water level logger can be deployed in those. And um, those, those will work well. And another common way of uh, deploying them is in uh, some sort of uh, protective housing on trees. We even have some logger, you know, a lot of users just put them uh, in a shady location that's near uh, where the water level logger is. And, um, and just got to be sure that it's not going to be a uh, location that's going to be uh, affected by sunshine because if that sun hits it, even if it's reflected sunshine, that can uh, throw off the temperature reading somewhat. And you want to make sure that it's got good air circulation. So if you're going to use the protective housing, make sure that it's got a lot of holes in it to, um, to allow the air to get to your logger. And you should get reasonably good air temperature data that way. It's going to slow down the temperature response a little bit, but uh, you know, it'll give you a good idea of what the air temperature is. Um, Okay, I, I briefly mentioned this before. Do you have suggestions for mounting barometric loggers in sites with freezing air temperatures? And that's a very good question. Um, and what I'm going to suggest here is uh, you want to mount the logger below ground level if possible to take advantage of the temper, temperature moderation of the ground. So one way of doing that is exactly what I described before, to mount it in a well that's being used for your groundwater monitoring. Um, and in some cases, though, that's not possible. You know, for example, if you're monitoring uh, like intermittent uh, stream beds, you know, you may not be able to. Uh, they may get flooded. So, what you might want to take a look at in those cases is making small, kind of mini stilling well out of PVC just for your barometric pressure logger that gets 
embedded into the ground. So uh, you can make this out of PVC, pound it into the ground. You can put one of those little dry points on it. Some things you want to consider in that is you want to have a vent hole in the well cap as usual, so it's uh, uh, measuring you know, the air pressure. Uh, you probably want to use slotted PVC pipes so that if any water gets into that little well that it's able to drain out. You don't want water building up inside that well because that would affect your barometric pressure readings. You throw them off. And you want to make sure that this uh, little mini well is above where it might get flooded because if that gets flooded, if it gets below the, the water table for any reason, that's going to throw off your barometric pressure readings because they're going to be high by that additional pressure from the water that's above it. It's not going to hurt the logger, but it's going to hurt the accuracy of your data. So um, you may need to look for a spot on your site that's higher so that it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't get flooded. So it's a good way um, to, uh, uh, to deploy a logger, this, especially you know, the ground is going to hopefully be, in most cases, especially if you can go deep enough, it's going to be above freezing. So you get the best temperature compensation accuracy for your barometric pressure logger. Okay, here's a related question, is uh, how do I use my own barometric pressure data for my own weather station to calibrate water level data from the logger? And uh, that's a good question, and you can do that. Uh, if you have a, a hobo weather station, uh, you can uh, link to that data file directly from the barometric uh, compensation assistant. So that's, that's really just as easy as using a barometric pressure file from a water level logger. Um, but if you have another brand of weather station, you can use that data as well. You just have to export it from uh, the software you know, associated with that weather station. And you might have to process the data to get it into the right format for importing it into the barometric compensation assistant. But the, the assistant will allow you to do that. You just got to get it into there's a few different time and date com uh, compatible formats that you can use. So you might have to process those a little bit. But you can use that data as well. And that's a nice way of leveraging data that you have. So another question that came up is, can you comment on barometric compensation for water level loggers in artesian wells that are sealed from the atmosphere? And just uh, here's a diagram I, I found on the the web that uh, talks a little bit about this. And, you know, uh, artesian wells are tied to aquifers that are, you know, the water is trapped and it's at a higher pressure than the, uh, the surface water. And, and I should probably say that I'm not a hydrologist, so if my terminology is a little off here, or uh, please pardon any misspeak. <laughs> uh, but uh, just, you, you'll get the idea. If you are a hydrologist, you'll understand better than I do. But, um, you know, so here's, if it's a, an open artesian well, you can see a picture of that down below where the water will come actually flowing out of that artesian well. So uh, it, it'll be hard to measure pressure in that because it's kind of it's being open to the atmosphere. It's relieving some of that pressure. What you really want to do is, uh, in these cases, is, is seal the well and measure the pressure in that well. So I think um, here's a couple of points. So you want to mount the barometric pressure logger as usual in the air, and then you want to have your uh, other hobo water level logger in the well to record the pressure in that pressurized well. The challenge, and, and you use that differential pressure from those to, to uh, calculate what the uh, uh, the uh, equivalent water level height would be you know, that, that pressure your um, your head you know uh, I guess I think it's the, the term that you should use is uh, you can figure out that water pressure but the trick is getting a good accurate reference for that and here's a couple of suggestions you could try if there's a nearby open well or if there's a way of extending your artesian well of of its potential water level, you can deploy a, um, uh, you can measure what that equivalent height is as you're launching the logger, and you just enter that uh, as you would any other 
reference water level measurement into the barometric compensation assistant, or you can use a calibrated reference uh, uh, pressure meter that you enter in terms of water height. So um, hopefully those are some ways you can uh, get good uh, water level data, water pressure data uh, in your artesian well. So switching gears a little bit uh, to the uh, our direct read water level logger, the MX2001, which has the, uh, uh, the Bluetooth readout. This is the one you can offload with your uh, mobile device, your iPad or your iPhone or Android device. Um, one of the common questions that we get is, how do I determine the right uh, Hobo MX2001 water level logger model and the correct uh, direct read cable length? So I always like to drop pictures when I'm answering this question. So here's a picture, and you want to make note on this picture of what your maximum water level range is and the, uh, the distance from your mounting point at the top of the well to uh, where the sensor is in the well or where you want the sensor to be in the well. And kind of do it in steps. So your first step is to look at your water level range. Um, and based on that maximum water level above the sensor, you want to select the proper MX2001 model. So we sell the four different models to cover 4 meter, 9 meter, 30 meter, and 76 meter ranges, uh, water level uh, changes. So pick the right model. And then you want to look at your cable length. So you start with your desired distance from the mounting point uh, to the sensor. And from that, you subtract uh, 0.3 meters or 1.3 feet uh, to account for the length of the logger and the length of the sensor. And then that gives you the, the target cable length that you want. And then uh, we sell uh, cables in, in two ways. We have custom cables, which can be any basically any length you want, specified in meters. And we also sell uh, cables in stock. Uh, these are the lengths that we stock. So those you can, you can get a little bit quicker, but um, you don't have quite as much flexibility. So if you're going to need a custom cable length, make sure to allow some time for those cables to be made up. So sometimes uh, you may want to move your uh, MX2001 uh, water level logger to a different well and uh, you know, the question comes up, can I adjust the directory cable length? Well, the cable, uh, uh, because we have very specific ends mounted on those, we want them to be waterproof. You can't uh, splice in cable or uh, remove, uh, cut out cable. Um, so what you really, the best option is to just replace the cable with uh, one of the desired lengths. And you can do that pretty easily because it's just, uh, uh, just a screw-off connector at either end. So uh, you do have to buy another cable in that case, but that's that's the easiest solution. But in a pinch, here's a couple options. Uh, first, if you want to shorten the cable, you can add a loop to the cable. You just have to be careful that that loop isn't bent any tighter than an inch. So if there's enough room in your well, you can do that. Then you want to secure that loop with uh, zip ties. So uh, use at least two, preferably three zip ties to lock that cable in place. Uh, another option is to lock, wrap cable around a one inch or three quarter inch pipe. Uh, another option uh, is to add an extension to the top of the well. It's just a small extra length. You know, like if you just need to add a foot, you might just add a one foot piece of PVC pipe to the top of the well to get it high enough so that you don't have to mess with your cable. The other situation, which is a little more challenging, is if your cable is a little too short. Um, like I said, you can't make your cable longer, but you can add a little extension cable at the top. Now, if you want to do wireless readout, we don't recommend going any more than a foot, or I'm sorry, a meter down into the well uh, to be able to do that wireless readout. So uh, you're a little limited there. And if you do go a foot I'm sorry, I keep 
showing my American tendency, speaking in feet instead of meters. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, if you go a meter down, that's going to reduce your wireless range for your Bluetooth readout. You still, you know, be able to do your your wireless readout with your your uh, smartphone or uh, iPad, but your range is going to be reduced. So those are a couple options. Let's see. Oh, another question that came up, which I thought was good, is for water level loggers, what happens when the salinity changes during the deployment? And as you may remember from looking at the barometric compensation assistant, which I show here, you enter in the type of water uh, that you're deploying the loggers in. It could be fresh water, salt water, brackish water. So there's some of your choices. But what happens if it's going, it's like in a tidal estuary, it's going from fresh water to salt water. Uh, that makes it a little more challenging. And uh, so to look at the impact on your accuracy, you want to look at the amount that the salinity is changing, and you want to look at the uh, uh, the water depth above it. So here's an example. If it's changing from like pure fresh water to full ocean salinity, that's going to result in an error of about three inches for a 10-foot depth of water. So three inches, that may or may not be significant. And you can reduce it in those kind of applications by, um, let's see, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm just talking, this is just talking about the, the calculation. Uh, but you can reduce that error by selecting the option for brackish water. Basically, you cut the error in half uh, by picking a point in the middle. That's all our uh, assistant is doing. It's not perfect, but it reduces your error, error to less than an inch and a half in most cases. But if you eat, need even more accuracy in these applications than that inch and a half, um, then what you're going to have to do is compensate for those salinity changes outside of our software. So that's going to require uh, recording the salinity, which you can do with our uh, Hobo U24 salinity, salinity logger, and that will give you your salinity data. But then you need to combine that. Uh, you have to convert that uh, salinity data to, to density and then use that density that you calculate to calculate your accurate, most accurate water level data. So it's a little bit of work. You can do it. We've got a lot of users that are doing that. We, uh, a lot of you are, are scientists and, and are used to doing this with your data. So next area, kind of the, the final area within the prepared questions was um, uh, on calibration. Uh, lots of uh, you were asking about calibration. Uh, um, how do I calibrate Hobo data loggers? Well, it depends upon your logger, what your options are. And so I put together this little table uh, that shows some of the options. Um, and there's three different types of calibration that you can do with our loggers. Uh, lab calibration, field calibration, and just a kind of a simple comparison check. So I'm going to skip ahead uh, to define those terms. A lab calibration is a calibration that's done in the lab before deployment, and that actually sets calibration coefficients in the logger. So basically, when you read out that data, it's calibrated uh, with those lab calibration coefficients. So uh, that's uh, you know that's a nice way to to get your, your, your data calibrated uh, in, you know, right from the get-go. Another option we have is field calibration. And this requires calibration readings taken in the field, you know, at your site. And those are later used with our Hobleware Pro data system to adjust the data after the deployment. And so that's another way of getting uh, a calibration. It's similar in accuracy to the, the lab calibration. And it also has the advantage of being able to correct from, for drift. So you can take a, a field calibration reading at the beginning and end of a deployment segment. And uh, our software, we use those to um, adjust for drift during the, um, the deployment. And that drift, is, in that case, is usually drift from following. So it can, you can adjust for minor following drift uh, using that field calibration. Uh, the, uh, third option 
is a comparison check. And that's basically you use some sort of precision meter to take some readings, and then you check the data afterwards to make sure they match up with those precision readings. And that's a pretty common uh, a part of uh, user field deployment protocols. So now I'm going to back up to that slide I showed you before, which shows you the options. And um, so for our temperature loggers, we don't have a lab calibration or field calibration option. We just have the comparison check. For U24 loggers, you have the option of field calibration and doing a comparison check. And the dissolved oxygen logger is the only one that we offer lab calibration for at this time. And it also has a field calibration option. Water level, you can do a field calibration or a comparison check. Uh, I should note for the field calibration, it's a one-point field calibration for the water level logger. So you have to pick a point somewhere in the deployment to use. And Usually that's good enough because there's not a lot of drift uh, with the water level measurements we found. So, so now I'm going to just talk a little bit more about each of those in, in, in more detail. So with the temperature loggers, generally there's very little drift in the accuracy of, of those over time. We just uh, you know, we deployed, I don't know what it is, millions of temperature loggers that we've deployed, and very little drift in those over time. But at some point, the readings do start to go south, so you want to check. Um, and so here's some different ways to check your temperature loggers before deploying them. One is to use a, a NIST traceable thermometer to take a reading next to the logger, make sure that it's uh, within the accuracy of the uh, uh, of the logger, and you've got to take into account the accuracy of the NIST traceable thermometer at this point as well. So that's a good way to check. Another very common way to um, uh, check the accuracy of the loggers is to deploy a bunch of them in, a, um, in an ice bath or some other stirred uh, uh, temperature bath that puts all the loggers at the same temperature. Then you look at the data from those and make sure that they're, um, uh, that they're all you know, within the error band of, of their accuracy spec. And if there's any outliers, you just don't deploy those loggers. So, uh, you just eliminate those loggers from your deployment. Hope you have a a few spares on hand to, uh, to fill in for those. And we have some users that actually take these calibration checks and use that data to uh, try to get more accuracy out of their temperature loggers after the deployment. And uh, you know, they effectively can uh, uh, increase the accuracy of their loggers by doing this uh, by a you know, factor of, of five or maybe even sometimes an, uh, an order of magnitude if you really use some precision correction factors. But you got to do that in software outside of our uh, connectivity loggers. Um, over here, this is a screenshot of the Hobo uh, U24 connectivity assistant. And over on the right side, you see the area for calibration. This is the field calibration. And it has a place where you can enter in the calibration points from the beginning of the deployment segment and the end uh, of the deployment segment. And uh, this allows it to correct for drift that might have happened during, during the deployment. Note when you use this, you have to use uh, the actual conductivity values. You, uh, so that you have to enter actual conductivity and not specific conductivity or salinity into this. So when you take your calibration readings with your field meter, make sure it's in actual conductivity. And you also need to record the temperature as part of that. Um, we do have some self-guided training uh, on how to do field calibrations in our, in our uh, website as part of our knowledge base. So a wealth of resources there uh, for, for getting into uh, the details, the nuts and bolts of good protocols for calibrating your loggers. Now for the dissolved oxygen logger, as I mentioned, there's several options. If you want to do the lab calibration, this is a screenshot from the lab calibration. This kind of walks you through uh, calibration. This is done in, at 100% calibration using either a calibration boot or uh, air saturated water if you have a, a way of uh, creating um, uh, air saturated water uh, using like a bubbler. And you just enter those readings in into the calibration assistant, and uh, it'll, it'll adjust the 
the uh, calibration factors in the logger. And there's the DO logger has a few options for field calibration, uh, several methods for taking field readings, and those can be entered into the calibration assistant in the field calibration area over on the right. Uh, you can use a meter, you can use the calibration boot I showed on the previous slide. Uh, you can use something called titration uh, as your reference and enter those into the, uh, the field calibration area. Another question that came up on calibration is how often do I need to calibrate the uh, Hobo DL logger? Um, uh, one piece of advice is to always start with a lab calibration or a field calibration. And then I would take field calibration readings before cleaning. Um, you know, uh, so you're, this is when I'm, this is when you're offloading data in the field. Uh, you you want to take a calibration reading before you clean off the sensor. And um, for that, dealing with the following, like we talked about before. And then you want to uh, take another calibration reading, another field calibration reading um, as you deploy it for, if you're redeploying it, you know, you want to take another field calibration reading after it's been cleaned. You know, you'll need those. So if in doubt, take more field calibration readings because they're always great ways of checking the accuracy and the integrity of your data. So I actually ran a little bit longer than I expected, so I haven't allowed a lot of time for uh, questions. I've addressed a few here. Um, and uh, this is kind of the free form. If there's other questions you'd like to address, we have a few minutes. And I actually, because you listened to me for a while, I'm going to let Eileen uh, address a couple of questions. So why don't I turn it over to her for a moment. Well, thank you, Paul. You get, you get to take a breath. Um, we did have a, a few other questions I'll, I'll address quickly. You did ask, uh, do we have a real-time logger for water level and temperature monitoring. We do have an RX weather station that uses the internet and it does use third-party sensors. You can add salinity, you can add water level to it. Uh, it's a 4 to 20 milliamp input and we have some application notes on exactly how to do that. It's close to real time. It's not real time. You wouldn't see uh, a graph moving. You can set alarms for sensor parameters. So depending on your application and uh, what the goal is, we can make a recommendation for you on, on how best to accomplish that. And we also have some self-guided trainings on that. And uh, it's a pretty nice and easy way to, do, uh, to add some water quality measurements and get that data through the internet and set alarms. Um, one other question that's a, a typical question, there's so many of you that have our water temp pro data loggers, uh, that's the U22001 part number. Um, they have a six-year battery, and the question was, given the small difference in cost, is it better to refurbish U22 loggers or purchase new ones? I think the list price of a, a U22 right now is $129. However, it does make sense for you to let us know. Give us a call. We ask you for the serial number and we provide you with a, a new data logger uh, for the cost of the battery replacement, which is $95. Uh, we found it, it makes sense for, for a lot of people and uh, you're used to using the logger and you are getting a new logger for the cost of a battery replacement. Uh, one other question uh, that came, came in is uh, I often get asked about uh, increasing the um, response time in water. Some people do really want a faster response time, and the question was, can they modify uh, the data loggers to be more thermally conductive to accomplish a fast response time? No, you really can't modify anything. Um, we do provide the specs for each data logger. Typically, um, you're going to get a spec in air and in water. The water temp pro and the tidbits and our pendants, uh, our low-cost uh, water temperature data loggers have about a five-minute response time in water. If you really do need something faster, we have a stainless logger with a probe, and that does respond as quickly as 20 seconds in water. Uh, it does have a sharp probe, so you'd probably want to be a little creative 
uh, depending on how you want to do that. But anytime you have some questions that are specific to your application, um, we really are so happy when you call us. And uh, typically, we'll work with you on helping you to choose the best logger. And we can send you some specific information that you can refer back to so you don't need to remember what we say. Um, Paul, I think there are a couple other questions that you might want to come up. We have about three or four more minutes or type in a question uh, if there's something we can address before the end of this. Um, yeah, I see a couple more questions have come in. Uh, does Onset offer any loggers to record both level and temperature? And um, yeah, I should have made that clear. Is our water level loggers uh, also record temperature? So. Uh, uh, if you're deploying your water level lockers, uh, you, you've got that temperature data available as well. And um, so, yeah, two measurements for the price of one. And let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, and yeah, um, how do you deploy sensors when there's a lot of mud at the site? I have problems with the sensors sinking. Yeah, that is a, that is a challenge in some environments. What I would recommend in that case is uh, driving something you know, like a PVC pipe or a fence post into the bottom of uh, the stream there, probably PVC pipe, so that uh, if there happens to be anybody going into that area that they're not going to hurt themselves. And hopefully you can drive that in far enough that you can um, find some more solid footing, and then you can mount the logger on that. Because, yeah, you want to keep the, uh, the logger above you know, the, the silt and the mud at the bottom because that's going to cause following pretty quickly and throw off your measurements. So um, so some sort of pipe to mount them helps. Another option is possibly to float something from the surface, but a lot of times you won't want to have something in the surface. So that may or may not be an option. Let's see, what else do we got? Um, oh, you, uh, you want to address that one? I don't think we do. <laughs> one, the, the question was, do we recommend any chemicals for uh, cleaning the dissolved oxygen caps or, or the copper windings? And do we recommend any chemicals for cleaning the old caps and, and copper windings? I usually ask the mechanical engineer or Paul. I don't think we do. I think we're just saying brush them off. Uh, easily, and uh, I will follow up on that. We are going to uh, supply all of you with a recorded webinar. We have a record of some of the questions, but we will follow up with you and address each one that's application specific. So uh, we may need to do a little homework on a few questions, but uh, we will address those for you. Yeah. Here's a question. Um, Another question, sometimes when retrieving a logger, the dissolved oxygen can be around zero. And that will not allow for biofouling correction using HOBOR. I was wondering what can be done to correct the data. That's, that's a good question because, yeah, if it's that small, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to do a, a field calibration. What I would do in that case is take the logger out of that environment and put it into a higher oxygen environment. You could even take a bucket of water and aerate that, and um, uh, get you know so you've got decent oxygen levels, and put your meter and your uh, logger in that bucket, and use that for your calibration reading. So that won't be valid data, but that could be used to do your field calibration to give you you know you know the accurate results that you'd expect. So that's that's a good question. Uh, let's see, maybe we're just about up against the time limit. We are. Uh, I would reiterate that we will, uh, I, inside sales applications, we'll follow up with everyone. So uh, feel free to submit any other questions, and we'll be happy to, uh, to address each one for you after the webinar. And uh, Thank you very much for attending. We've got a couple uh, resources uh, real quick. Um, and yeah, we do where. have some great uh, We have the knowledge base, some self-guided training, and there's our contact information. You certainly can contact us 
and uh, we'll be able to get back to any uh, application-specific questions for you and send you some resources. Thank you very much for attending. We appreciate the, the questions that you did send in. And feel free to contact us uh, 8 to 5 Eastern Time. Tech support is here 8 to 8 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. For those of you who already have data loggers and have some questions, they are the, the ones that would be able to help you with uh, uh, any uh, data questions and technical questions on software. So thank you again. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Eileen.